nation. And I've taught UCC history, theology, and polity at Pacific School of Religion for some years, but I've decided to spare you the 47 PowerPoint slides and not give you the whole semester version, but give you the 15 minute version. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So our history is that we're a denomination that's grounded in the Protestant Reformation, from which came um, Reformed and Lutheran um, streams of Protestantism. We are grounded in the Reformation in England. It was the Reformation in England that gave birth to Congregationalists. And when these folks started immigrating to this side of the pond, what we got were several different waves of immigration. German reformed immigrants, German evangelical, and the Congregationalists who were um, the Pilgrims, the Puritans that you learned about in school. And um, also at the same time, a little bit later, growing up on the American frontier in the early 1800s was a group that just called themselves Christian. They were specifically anti-denominational. They said denominations were an abomination and that all the faith called them to be was Christian. And they only, uh, the only thing that mattered was that you were a person of good behavior. And so what happened was, as we moved into the 20th century, there was a great movement toward ecumenism among denominations and they, they were coming together and they were talking about how can we work together and how can we worship together. And in the early 20th century, two of those German streams, the German Reformed Church and the Evangelicals merged in the 1930s to fo form the Evangelical and Reformed Church. And the Congregationalists and the Christian Church, the little frontier denomination, merged to form the Congregational Christian Church. And you can probably see where this is going. Um, they almost immediately started talking merger with one another. And so um, the conversation started in the 1940s. And in 1957, the United Church of Christ was formed by the merger of the ENR and the Congregational Christian. Uh, so the denomination is 60 years old, which is pretty young. By faith, uh, <laughs> tradition standards. And how do you know a UCC church? Well, a lot of them have congregational in their name. Because if they were congregational churches before the merger, they, and they kept their name, you get the First Congregational Church of Berkeley, and the First Congregational Church of Palo Alto, and the Congregational Church of Belmont. And they came into the UCC and kept those names. The evangelical and reformed churches tended to have names, they, they named themselves after saints. There are a lot of St. John's. There's a lot of St. John's UCC churches in the country. But churches that were formed after the merger in 1957, some of them took names like that and some of them, like Island United Church, took a name that had nothing to do with those traditions, but um, you find churches that are named after places, parks, streets. I served the Arlington Community Church in the East Bay, which is on the Arlington in Kensington. It's named for the street. So uh, it gets a little harder to tell with newer churches. Um, there are UCC churches with names like the Church of the Open Table or something like that. Um, but so there's a, you can't always tell by the name, but when you see congregational churches, they're UCC churches, and they often say United Church of Christ underneath. The UCC um, has a very proud history of firsts. They, the, uh, the congregationalists were active abolitionists in the 1800s, opposed to slavery in the United States, they ordained the first woman uh, in 1853 as an authorized minister in a church. They ordained the first black man. They ordained the first openly gay man right here in our Golden Gate Association that we're a part of at the San Carlos Church. Um, they, uh, it, 
we've been known for calling out uh, for environmental justice, um, for marriage equality, for equality on the airwaves of uh, stations that in the late 50s and the 60s discriminated against black commentators and also refused to share news of, about racism. So um, we have a pretty proud history um, in, in justice work. We're kind of known as the ACT UP denomination. But we have um, a very broad uh, span of people in terms of their theologies because a lot of people have come to the UCC from somewhere else. Um, it's become a bit of a refuge for um, many people uh, who consider themselves to be Christian and who can't buy into a lot of what Christianity has come to mean. Um, we are not dogmatic. We do not require that anybody subscribe to a statement of faith, like the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, to be a member of this church. We have great respect for the ancient creeds of the church. But to us, they are testimonies of faith, not tests. There's a big difference. They are testimonies of faith, not tests. Um, and we also, we have so many people who come from other traditions that many of our churches are kind of shaped in their theology by those folks. Some are more conservative than others. Now, um, with all of its emphasis on inclusivity, for example, as you can see from the flag ham hanging in the back, this is an open and affirming congregation, which means we are welcoming and supportive of the membership and the ministries of LGBTQ persons. Not every church in the UCC is an open and affirming church, <laughs> even though the denomination has named itself as being welcoming. The reason for that gets into a thing about our polity. We have a covenantal polity. It is not hierarchical. There are not people at the top at the national setting of the church that tell us what we have to do or what we have to believe. The unit of authority and autonomy in the UCC is the local church. Is the local church. We make decisions for ourselves. We own our own property and can dispose of our own property. We call and dismiss our own clergy. So there is no um, bishop or other level that controls that. Now there are other settings of the church, not levels. We are part of an association, the Golden Gate Association, and we have six associations that are part of the Northern California Nevada Conference, and there are 38 conferences that are part of the national church. But the national church cannot tell us what to do. This goes back to the independence of being congregationalists. That, um, that kind of autonomy was um, paramount in the early churches in New England. Now, the other side of autonomy is covenant. We live in covenant. We pledge to be together even when we disagree, and to stay in the conversation, and to honor one another, and to work with one another. Um, we do have a statement of faith. It's not a creed, as I said, that anybody has to subscribe to, but it's a wonderful statement of faith. And in the Constitution of the UCC, it says in the preamble that it is incumbent upon each generation to make this faith its own. This is, you probably heard the, the God is still speaking um, uh, tagline. That's the constitutional version of God is still speaking. We really believe that God has not finished um, moving in our midst and leading us in ways that we can create a better, more just world. Um, we are strongly invested in education. That was the Congregationalists that planted Harvard and Yale and a number of other institutions. We have a lot of investment in black institutions of higher learning, uh, seven seminaries across the United States that are UCC um, seminaries. Um, the, um, 
The National Church meets every two years in a general synod. The last one was held this past summer in, in Baltimore. And representatives from all the conferences come together. And the synod um, does reflection for the whole church and does pass resolutions. For example, the marriage equality resolution that was passed in 2005 um, was, was a resolution of the church, but it wasn't binding on any church or any association or any conference. As a matter of fact, we lost a conference <coughs> over the marriage equality um, resolution, which shows you know, that there's a, a wide range of, of differences and perspectives. We had an entire conference withdraw from the denomination because of that particular decision. I should put, it, should put an arrow on the yeah. door. <laughs> Enter here. We have special groups um, to encourage the ministry and the development of leaders um, in, for example, the Hispanic and Samoan and Pacific Islander populations, the indigenous populations, and some special initiatives to encourage young clergy. Leadership development is really, really important for us. So um, I promised not um, 45 slides, but there's one. Come on. There it is. Okay. Which is just to summarize some of the points that are the ethos or the foundation of the UCC. And in 2014, they came up with this paradigm of these three, um, three foci that we are a church of continuing testament, that we believe in the principles of scripture and um, are, are led by the teachings of Jesus, that we are committed to an extravagant welcome, a welcome for all people that's unconditional, and that we're committed to changing lives through social justice, which I've already um, talked about. Um, so we have a bold public voice, we form welcoming congregations, we're engaged in connecting our faith and the world. And we are seeking to form excellent, diverse leaders, especially young leaders. <laughs> in the last year, um, this evolved into a new purpose statement, a new mission statement, and a vision. The vision being a just world for all. A just, and there's a new little symbol. There's some brochures on the back table, and I should have put the logo up there. There's a new logo that's kind of a hand holding the world, and the, the focus is a just world for all. Um, the mission, we welcome all, love all, and seek justice for all. And the purpose, straight from scripture, to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves, and as Jesus said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Um, so before I tell you a little bit about this church, any questions about the UCC that I can answer? Well, at any point, if you think like, yes? When you say all faiths, so does it go outside Christianity, like Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism? The United Church of Christ is a Christian denomination, but we are open to having anyone join us who feels so moved. Um, we are obviously committed to interfaith, to multi-faith dialogue. We actually have, there, there's, a, there's a Hindu gentleman who lives in the community here who comes regularly and he, either before our service or afterwards, and he lights candles and he leaves them here on the communion table, and he spends a few moments praying to his ancestors. And for him, this is a sacred space. This is the sacred space in the neighborhood that he comes to. And we are delighted that he does that. Good. And our members, like at my church, I'm UCC, um, we, we have members that are Jewish and Buddhist and atheist, and you know, that's all over. You don't have to swear that Christ is your leader to be a part of the exactly. Community. Exactly. So a few things about this church. Island United Church was originally planted in 1969, so that's after the merger. 
which may account for it being called Island United Church instead of the first congregational church of Foster City. But there's a little more to it than that because when Foster City was first being designed, the United Methodist Church and the Presbyterian Church USA and the UCC didn't really want to kind of carve up the, the territory. And remember, this was in a time when uh, mainline Protestantism was pretty healthy. You know, there, there, was a, there were a lot of people out there who would probably be looking for a church. So those three denominations decided to plant three churches in cooperation. So this church was planted as a cooperative ministry of three denominations. And um, it doesn't look so empty to me anymore, but if you look, looking at that wall, there were two other banners on the other side, on the sides of that one that says United Church of Christ. And one said United Methodist Church and the other one said Presbyterian Church USA. <laughs> well, we were one of those three churches which over time have independently kind of morphed to being single denomination churches. The one in Half Moon Bay became a Methodist church. The one in Pittsburgh, Antioch, became a Presbyterian church. This one has grown into being solely a UCC church. And not all that long ago, we um, officially made our home solely as a UCC church because our linkage to the other two was really in name only. And we very gratefully and graciously sent them the banners, which were really quite beautiful banners like this. And um, with our thanks for everything they contributed to our history and we sent the banners to their judicatories. Um, we're very small in numbers. You're in our space. This is it. We're very small in numbers, but we're very big in heart. Um, we have declared ourselves to be open and affirming. We run the All Our Friends Montessori Preschool, which is the back two-thirds of this building. They are not renters. They are us. And we're very proud of the school and the contributions that it's made uh, to the community. And many of our members have a, have a great investment in education and in children. We really value interfaith dialogue and the intellectual work of book and Bible study. I should have mentioned earlier that one of the tenets of the United Church of Christ is we take the Bible seriously but not literally. And struggling with scripture and fighting with texts is something we do really well. <laughs> um, our largest community outreach is to Life Moves in, um, in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties, which is helping in so many ways to help overcome homelessness. So, as we say here every Sunday, whoever you are, and wherever you are on your life's journey, you're welcome. Uh, if there's any questions I can answer, I'd be happy to do that. How big is your congregation? Um, it's about 35. I would say a Sunday is 20. So you know everybody personally. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and all of their secrets. <laughs> it's a delightful bunch of people with its own very special um, spirit. We're fortunate to have um, Alexis as our moderator, which is kind of like the lay president of the congregation. We are um, multicultural in a lot of ways. We have uh, uh, Asian members. And, uh, it's pretty exciting. Pretty exciting little place to be. Carol, yes. Carol, how long have you been with the church here? Almost three years. Where were you from? Pardon me? Where did you, you come from? Where did I come from? <laughs> I was born and grew up in Washington, D.C. No, um, the, the last calling I had before this was as a transitional minister at the UCC Church in Campbell. Um, this is the sixth church I've served. I've been at Campbell. I've been at Sonoma. I've been at Grace North Church in Berkeley. I served the first congregational church in Redwood City for seven years. And the Arlington Community Church in the East Bay for seven years. So I've been kicking around this conference for a while. <laughs> yeah. Carol, 
Carol, you said that there are seven seminaries across the country that have a UCC affiliation. Can you tell us a little bit about what the process is to become ordained? Yes. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, the, the, first of all, our clergy are, uh, they come to churches by a search and call system. So there's no appointed, uh, there's not a, a, an appointed call, like in the Methodist church, for example. Um, our candidates um, are received as members in discernment by a conference or an association, first by their local church. The, you, the local church needs to recognize a person who comes to them and says, I'm feeling a call to ministry, it recognizes them as a member in discernment. Then they become a member in discernment of the conference. They're expected to go to seminary or have the equivalent of an MDiv degree. And we've done a lot more work lately with what equivalency means because not everybody can have a, a four-year undergraduate, three-year graduate education. And some people have wonderful education and wonderful experience that we really have found can equate to what a Master of Divinity degree would be. They have um, interviews with the Committee on Ministry. They are given a clergy advisor. There's quite a list of requirements at the end of which they write uh, a pretty heavy ordination paper, which is then presented to the committee and is then presented to the association. Now, um, if approvals come all along the way, then the person is then approved for ordination pending receipt of a call. We do not ordain people without a call. So they need to have their first call to ministry before they can be ordained. How do they do that? They fill out a very extensive profile, which is circulated to churches, who have also filled out a local church profile, and it's a search committee of the church. That does, that's, the, that's the compact answer. Any other questions? Well, we're a fascinating bunch. Yeah. Quick question. Um, so you have a nursery school. Does that help feed to your congregation so that the parents of the children then come to this church? And then what is the makeup age-wise of the actual church that is in The school does not feed the church. The school is a Montessori school, which by definition can't be religiously affiliated so they and the majority of the families in the preschool are of different cultural and faith traditions than Christianity and while we do invite them to like some social events and we do some things together there really is no and we have great relationship but there's really no connection between the preschool families and the church um, the church itself is older. <laughs> We're all um, middle-aged to elderly, but there are three uh, young people in the church. I'm pretty excited about that. And um, our relationships with each other are good. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions? I'll be happy to answer those later. And I'm going to get myself a little bit of coffee. Mm -hmm. and